Hi, everyone. Now I can actually see you. Um, so I'm here to talk about Heroku 2015 year review. Um, every year, we basically, for a better talk, we just talk about new features and things that have happened since last year at Rails Talk. Um, I'm Terrence Lee. I go by Hono2 on Twitter. I work with Richard Schneeman, who gave the talk yesterday, uh, Speed Up Science, or something like that. Uh, I actually got kicked out of that room um, because I was a fire hazard. But uh, we work on the Ruby experience at Heroku, which means every time you deploy a Ruby app, that is code that you're running from us. And so if there's actually a problem with that, then that is our fault. You should come and talk to us about that. Both of us are here to the Heroku group, so you should just come and stop by. So today, I'm going to talk about a few different things, as well as uh, Will here on the right, and Puichi um, as well. So first off, I'm just going to cover some general Heroku features and things that have come out since last RailsConf. Uh, we have also have an amazing Postgres product, and Will comes works on that team, so he's going to cover some new features that have happened uh, in the Postgres land there. Uh, I'm going to cover some stuff with specific to Ruby, things we worked on, some announcements and stuff like that that you should be aware of. And then finally, we is going to cover basically some of the work that um, Matt's team that he's on has worked on in the last year as well. So on to Roku. So when, when I'm talking about Roku, I kind of just mean like the general product, like the runtime and the build service and things like that. Um, so one of the really cool things that we've launched uh, in the past year has been Roku Button. And so if you've seen these around in GitHub uh, repos in the readme, there's basically this purple deploy button. And when you click on it, you get redirected to a Heroku page to basically deploy your own copy of that application. So in there, you can specify. So you like just type in a different name that you want. If you leave a blank, we'll make up a random uh, poetic Heroku name for you. And then inside of the this thing, you can specify add-ons and other things uh, to basically define like what it takes to actually set up a template of this. So this is great for any demos. Uh, that you have, like if you're preparing a presentation, I've used these before last year when I was doing a bunch of web socket stuff uh, at a conference last year. And so basically all the demo presentation, the demos that I had, uh, people would just click the deploy button and get their own version of like the, chat, the typical hello world chat thing for web sockets. Um, so just very simply to actually set this up, you just have a readme and then inside of it, you just in the markdown, you just point it to this image and then link it to upload the deploy. And so when you click that button, it'll know what repo you're coming from and actually set that all up. And the actual magic behind it uh, is with the app setup is there's this app.json file that you put in your repo. And inside of that, it takes a certain set of keys um, and you just specify the name, description. Um, and then some of the interesting stuff is like the add-on. So you can pick various Roku add-ons like if you need that to get it up and running. So maybe you're depending on Redis. Like in my WebSockets example, uh, I'm doing session and pub sub using Redis. So I specify a Redis add-on provider. In this case, it's just like the free tier. So anyone deploying this thing will actually get a completely working thing. They don't have to go through and like Heroku create and then like get clone the app and then actually like manually go through and add all the add-ons and stuff. In addition, you can also set up environment variables. So if you need to set up specific environments to get that app up and running, you can specify all that stuff in here. It's just a hash inside of the JSON, as well as any scripts and stuff that you need to run there. Um, so you can do some post deploy and things like that. Um, so that's the app.json, and so once you include that, as well as the button on the readme, your app is good to go for the Roku button. Um, the next thing that we, one of the other things that we worked on has been GitHub integration. I know this has been something that a lot of people have been asking for for a while, uh, and there's ways to achieve this using stuff like CodeShip. If you just use their CI service, you can have them actually just deploy to Roku, or Travis has something as well. But directly through Heroku, if you go through the um, GitHub OAuth flow and connect it with Heroku, uh, 
um, you can then through the deploy tab like connect your apps to a GitHub repo. And so you can have it auto deploy to a from a specific branch. So say you're working on like a feature for a client and every time you commit you want to deploy to a staging application to then show the client. Um, so every time you push to GitHub, it'll automatically do a callback, a webhook callback to actually do that deploy. You can also manually deploy specific things straight through the web interface and not have to do git push. So a great feature for doing stuff in staging. Um, if you're doing things in production and you have stuff tied to CI, I still would probably recommend kind of not doing it this way, but um, I think this is great for handling various PRs and other features that you just want to easily get that up and out there and not have to worry about that stuff. Um, so we recently launched uh, this last week uh, Heroku Elements, and a lot of you who've used Heroku before are familiar with our add-ons ecosystem, so uh, the Postgres add-on for getting a Postgres database. Uh, we have you know, Fastly for some CDN stuff, New Relic, uh, and various other services uh, out there for using that. Um, so in the elements that, that we now have add-ons as well as our build packs for, so when you're deploying your Ruby app you're using the Heroku Ruby build pack, but you can go and like fork and make your own custom build pack. And as part of this, you can look and see without searching through GitHub, like various uh, build packs that are available that you can now like search through and use. So like maybe you want to add Nginx or you want to go and add like Phantom JS as part of your application because you're going through and driving like form filling or something in a worker process. Um, and so now like all those things are easily searchable in here. In addition, uh, with the Broku CLI, we have this plugin system, and as part of this, you can kind of search through and look for various plugins to then extend and add to your uh, Heroku command line experience. So all, all those things are wrapped up into one place that you can go and kind of piecemeal together to build your integrated app experience on Heroku. Um, in addition to that, for those of you who are dealing with clients or in Europe, we announced PX Dynos and NERP. And PX Dynos are the six gigabyte uh, instances that are run um, by themselves, so they're not multi tenant. So you don't have to deal with any noisy neighbor problems. Uh, and you get much more consistent performance. Um, so this is great for anyone dealing with things in Europe. Uh, so if you are using a bunch of web servers and stuff that you want to basically scale out, uh, yeah. that's great for. Um, being able to get that scale and kind of having the master process there, uh, load balance per process and getting more workers. Um, and then we also announced the Cedar 14 stack, uh, which is based off of the latest LTS release, which is Ubuntu 14.04. And with this, it brings hopefully not a lot of changes that you're going to notice, but like uh, more up to date libraries in the back end uh, for a lot of it for security purposes. Um, and um, basically, we dealt with a lot of the hard work for you know smoke testing uh, things, upgrading our own maps internally before launching this. And we had a fairly long, or like a decent long beta period for uh, testing all that stuff out. So uh, a lot of people are probably still on the Cedar stack. Um, and with this announcement, we basically uh, have are going to be sunsetting Cedar at some point. Uh, so on November 4th this year, uh, Cedar will be reti retired. So you should look into migrating your Cedar apps to Cedar 14. Um, and it's pretty simple. You just do, you can set the stack on for your next push. You just specify Cedar 14. And then you just do a commit. And then when you do git push for Open Master, it will build it on the new Cedar stack. And you'll be running on the new Cedar stack uh, on your next push. If you do run into any issues, uh, you can use the broker rollback command that's uh, still available to, uh, to roll back your slug to the previous image. Um, so pretty easy way to do any migrations and recommend doing this on a staging application of your app before trying it in production. Um, because there are a lot of changes. Uh, so it's been like four years, I guess, since the last Ubuntu that we've been using. So, I mean, LibC and some other things have changed under the hood a little bit. Um, and if you go to the 
Cedar 14 blog posts, uh, or just search in Dev Center. We do have some articles for some gotchas and things uh, that you might want to be aware of um, with that. Uh, so the next thing uh, with uh, more security and things, uh, there's, we now have two-factor off, so you can set up your phone to basically have a second factor of authentication um, in addition to your password. Uh, so this is great for you know, security and other things. Uh, like I know Slack recently had a security issue within the last few months where um, a bunch of people had to hold their passwords, and now I have like eight Slack accounts that have a bunch of two-factor stuff that I have to log in with. But we at Group now so have supported this in the last year. Um, so this is great because if you are deploying, you know, like your business and other things that you want it to be extra secure. Um, recently, we shipped HD Git and switched all of our default uh, stuff over to Git, so now you don't have to deal with H SSH keys, uh, which sometimes were issues I've seen in support tickets with customers with. Uh, having multiple Roku accounts and having to basically like switch your SSH keys in and out. Uh, now this all goes through SSL. Um, and this is also great for Windows users where SSH has been a huge pain um, with that. So uh, great work there. Um, and so DHH, I guess, talked about in his keynote about Action Cable uh, with WebSockets. Um, being powered by Redis for some of the pub sub stuff. And so one of the great things was we announced uh, WebSocket support recently, or I guess like kind of the end of last year. Um, and this has been in, in labs for a while, but WebSockets are enabled by default whether you're using them or not, so they're enabled on the router. So uh, when Redis 5 launches and you want to use Action Cable, it will work out of the box, at least for the WebSockets end. Um, and if you want to play around with Bay and other things, we have a chat example on the Dev Center article, or on the Dev Center sites for actually just like using Bay as a WebSocket driver and running that and working on Roku. So great, uh, great time to check out WebSockets for Rails 5 lens. Uh, and so recently we relaunched Dashboard and we've done a bunch of work there. Uh, and one of, the, one of the most interesting things for me has been just all the metrics stuff that's been on there. So you now can get like response time, throughput, dynalode, uh, there's memory graph as well. And I know this is something where we've gotten a lot of requests for just like introspection into your actual application. So if you're an active user group, you've probably already seen a bunch of this, but uh, just go through the dashboard and just look at all the graphs that are out there. Um, and this is something that we're continually iterating on and trying to improve upon. So Dashboard will be landing a bunch of new features uh, as time goes on. Um, so I'm going to hand this off to Will to talk about Roku Postgres. We have a number of cool things that came out last year that I want to talk about, both uh, in the Roku Postgres product and also in uh, Postgres itself. Uh, let's see uh, yeah, so the big thing is PostgreSQL 9.4 was released earlier this year as a community project. Uh, we support it currently in um, a beta capacity, so you have to say uh, dash dash version 9.4 when you provision it. But um, hopefully, uh, very soon, I think, like this week or next week, it's going to become the, the official one, so we make a new database to get 9.4. Um, and the, the, the greatest thing about Postgres 9.4 is the, uh, the JSON and B support. And so for the last two versions of Postgres, 9.2 and 9.3, you've been able to use a JSON column. But it didn't really do much except for just some uh, syntax checking to make sure it's valid JSON. Uh, that still was uh, super useful because you could pair it with uh, something like uh, PLV8, which lets you run the V8 JavaScript engine inside Postgres, and you can do some crazy cool stuff with uh, parsing out documents, uh, putting check constraints on to make sure that only valid documents that match uh, your custom rules get in and so on. Uh, but the really cool thing about um, JSON B is that it is stores the uh, representation under the hood is in a binary format. 
And so the Postgres developers were able to get um, some super impressive speed improvements out of this. Uh, and actually, uh, there's some uh, really good benchmarks that um, uh, PG Experts did where it shows that in several cases, the insert and update delete is faster than other uh, document databases that all they do is documents. Um, and uh, one of the, the, great, the great things is, um, so that's it. Uh, it, it's a, it's supported in Rails. Uh, there's this patch, um, but the and that's how that's how you can get it inside your. If you want to use this in Rails, you can just say JSON instead. Um, but so okay, so there's not a lot for this. But one of the really cool things that you can do is with the JSON support is uh, Postgres has uh, JIN indexes, which is general inverted index, and that lets you. Uh, you can do that for uh, several other data types, but when you use it with a JSON view data type, you get an inverted index on every single document. So instead of some other document databases where you have to say, oh, I want an index on this key or this key, you can get it on everything. And so you can do uh, really great searches uh, you know, using an index on anything in your, in your uh, document database there. And then what's really awesome is a pattern that we use internally a lot is we'll have our regular uh, rows and our regular models, and then just have, uh, before we used HDOR, now we use JSOND, have a, a, a column in there, and that way as you work on your application, you can uh, kind of add some extra data before maybe later promoting it out to a proper column. Um, and um, is, there, is there Yeah, time? Okay, so I want to tell you that there's, a, there's actually a cool story here with the JSOND stuff. And so, um, like uh, Ruby, where uh, directly, you know, with Ruby we employ uh, several of the uh, Ruby core members to work on Ruby. Uh, over the last several years, we've sponsored the development of uh, uh, actually uh, quite a number of the Postgres features. And uh, one of them was uh, you know, the, the previous JSON, and we wanted to help get uh, JSOND in. Um, there's a group of uh, Postgres developers referred to commonly as the Russians. Uh, it's because they're Russian. And uh, if, if you talk to the Postgres developers, they'll, they'll know exactly which three people you're talking about. And uh, so they, they made HDOR uh, several years ago. And they uh, were like, but HDOR, for those of you who, used it, who haven't used it before, it's a key value store in Postgres that is just um, strings only, and it's flat. And so the, the Russians are like, oh, you know, we're going to work on HDOR too. It's going to be great. It's going to have uh, Booleans. It's going to have numbers. And you can dust it. And we say to them, we're like, just do JSON. And they're like, no, 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 we'll, we'll do HDOR too first. And like, come on. And so, we uh, sponsored a project to build uh, JSONB on top of their infrastructure, but it wasn't looking like, like it wasn't going to get in. And uh, we did you know, a bunch of negotiations to get everyone on the same page. And it was like just under the wire for the, the end of the free feature freeze. And it got in, and like, this is, this is it's a really cool feature. Like, and uh, spin, you know, I encourage all of you to you know, use that Postgres 9 for spin and stuff and play with it, because uh, it, it makes building applications so much nicer to have that sort of semi-structured with a structured base or check out there in the same place. Um, so another thing here is uh, data clips. Uh, so we've had data clips at, on Postgres for a little while, uh, but it recently got a very nice uh, design refresh. And um, uh, for those of you who haven't used this before, it's a, it's a really powerful tool. Um, most of the internal like BI uh, business stuff that we do internally at Rookie is powered by Powerbook data clips itself, and uh, what it is is you can uh, type in a query. You can say uh, dataclips.rookie.com. You type in a query, you get to see the results, sort of like a GitHub gist, but for your data, uh, and you can share that around with uh, people in your company. And what's really great is it's a read-only access to your your data. And so if you have some um, uh, you know, business people say in your company that you don't really want to give full rewrite access to the data, this is a great way to get to them, uh, you know, let them use their own queries and stuff. And uh, what's really nice is it has a uh, CSV format, and you can take that and import it into Google Documents, and you can build spreadsheets and uh, dashboards and stuff off there. And it's, uh, it's a super powerful feature that uh, I really like a lot. Uh, another recent change is we've made a lot of improvements to uh, our PG Backup service. And uh, to sort of designate the, the old system from the new, the name uh, changed by adding a, a colon there. Uh, and so uh, we had a, a lot of problems, not, not a lot of problems, but uh, some people had issues with uh, the old system, like on a very big backup, it would fail uploading and such. Uh, this new one has been re-architected, and 
it's much more much more reliable. Um, so this this uh, I think it rolled out uh, pretty recently, um, and we're in the process of migrating people's old backups from the old system to the new one, and so it should be a pretty smooth a pretty smooth upgrade. Uh, and yeah, another uh, big feature of the, the, the new PG backups is you can schedule uh, when you want your daily backup to be before uh, everyone. Uh, they didn't have the same time, but because we would queue all the jobs at once and let them play out over the course of like uh, I don't know, nine, twelve hours. But uh, this one, you can say like, if, if for example, uh, you're you know from a different part of the world and you're off peak hours or at a different time, you can you can specify that up front, and it makes for a nicer, much nicer product. Um, this one, I uh, I think is really awesome because I wrote it. It's a PG diagnosis. It's a uh, with, you know, seeing a lot of support tickets, we end up looking at the same sort of things for looking for problems. And what this does is it's um, a com you know it's a command right in the CLI that generates a report and looks for a lot of common common issues. And uh, the backend for this is all open source. If you want to see exactly what it's doing, you can uh, check out uh, GitHub or review PG Diagnose. Uh, but you know, let's let's take a look, look here into what some of these things are. So uh, one one big problem with, with Postgres is if you have a query running for a long time. Because of the uh, MVCC architecture that Postgres has, a uh, long run of query keeps the, uh, the snapshot open for a long time, and that can start to cause problems after, you know, it depends on how, how fast other parts of your database system are running, but like this example here, nine days, like that's, that's way too long. And so, um, what you can, what, you, what this does is it, it checks for those long queries and it gives you the uh, process ID there so you can go and kill it. Um, and then another one here is hit rate. And so what this will do look for through all of your uh, tables and all of your indexes and tell you what the, uh, the cache hit rate is. And you really want, uh, if you're hit rate, you really want it to be like really in the 99 plus percent. And because anything lower than that, like if it's 98 percent, that means 2% uh, of the queries are, have to go all the way to disk to get the answer back rather than it being in the, either the Postgres cache or the operating system uh, file cache. And that, that really, that really slows it down. So if you're seeing that you have low hit rates, either um, that's either commonly caused by a change in uh, query patterns, or it could be a, a good sign you need to move up to a larger plan more RAM. Um, the other thing that's nice in here is um, the indexes, and this will actually run through a bunch of checks. It'll tell you if you have an index that is never used, and so you know you're just spending a lot of time and a lot of energy maintaining that index on every uh, you know insert up and delete uh, when you never actually end up hitting it, and so that's a good candidate to, to get rid of. Another thing that it's not in this example here, but it'll show you um, indexes that have a large volume of write on an underlying table but are rarely used. These ones are a little more tricky. You need to use good judgment there if it's okay to drop them, but those can also be a great candidate for. Uh, yeah, trim down your database and making it better. Uh, the next check here, bloat. Uh, I mentioned before uh, that Postgres is MVCC, so that means anytime there's an insert, delete, yeah, insert, delete, it doesn't actually modify the old data, it just keeps track of which, from the, the minimum transaction that was visible to, to the maximum transaction it was visible to, and so when you actually do delete data, it's not actually moved from disk right away. And um, there's another process that goes along in the background called the auto vacuum, and that, that actually goes in and then deletes things uh, after the fact. But what can happen in certain pathological cases is that your table becomes bloated and your indexes become bloated with all these dead values. And um, that's something that it's, well, once you don't look for it, you look for it, but um, a lot of people aren't aware of this, and so having this in the, in the tool here is super helpful. Um, another thing is if you're getting close to your connection count, uh, one thing with Postgres is that every single backend takes about um, five to 10 megabytes of, of RAM. And so you do want to keep your connection count down. Um, this one, it looks at what plan you have and, and it has the recommendation of the connection counts per plan and it will alert if you're getting high. Uh, moving on down, idle and transaction. I know, similar to the long queries, if you have a transaction open for a long time, it's uh, the same as uh, you know, executing a query for a long time. It has to keep all that data for when it is. And that'll tell you, I don't transaction, you should kill it. Um, blocking queries, if you uh, are doing something that creates a lock and other queries are waiting on it, they'll show up. And then just uh, loading the system, which is pretty straightforward. But anyways, it's a great tool. Uh, I'm a little biased in saying that, but uh, I think it really helps uh, really give you a quick diagnosis of what's going on in the database. 
Uh, one, one thing that's uh, really awesome that came out in the last year is this expensive queries. And this is over at uh, postgres.org.com rather than the, um, the main review dashboard for technical you know, time. Uh, and what this is cool that it actually uses an underlying feature called uh, PGStat Statements, which uh, one of my colleagues uh, made some huge improvements to uh, and got it committed into Postgres. Uh, that's Peter Gagan. The, um, what, what this does is it looks at all your queries and it, it takes out the constants and replaces them in question mark and then groups them together. And you can see what your uh, average execution time, the total uh, execution time, like uh, how much I.O. it's spending, and it gives you a graph over time. And this is uh, really helpful to uh, look at from time to time and see where the hotspots in your database is. It's a good way to find if you have a missing index or so and you need more indexes. And uh, I think this is towards the end. Yeah. I think yeah. Uh, this is a this is a, it's it's pretty cool, but it's a, you know you're not going to probably use this every day. But uh, fork fast. Uh, so for a long time now, post uh, root request has supported uh, fork and follow. Uh, follow is like a read replica that stays up to date forever. And fork is a second instance of the database that uses the same underlying technology, but then stops progressing. And the forks are really helpful if you want to test out a migration. Um, but one of the, the, the way that the Postgres replication works is that there's a base backup, and then um, uh, ind individual right ahead block segments get uploaded. And um, when you do a normal fork, uh, it downloads the most recent base backup and it keeps playing, replaying the wall files until it gets to uh, the current time. What fork fast will do is it'll just stop it after, um, after the base backup. Uh, why would you want this? Uh, well, one reason is it, it does it typically be uh, a little bit faster because it doesn't have to do that extra work. And if all you are doing is testing a, a um, you know, migration of sorts, or if you want to take a backup off of uh, not your primary system, then like, the exact time doesn't really matter. This can save you uh, a good amount of time in some cases. And thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about some things we've done specifically in Ruby in the last while. So uh, Zach, who's actually sitting out here in the front, uh, helped me, but we actually maintain Ruby 187 and 192 for the whole community for a while. Uh, uh, for various reasons, uh, a lot of people were kind of on these old Rubies, and we wanted to give people a nicer window to actually upgrade and move off of it in a more reasonable time. Um, but at in the middle of summer last year, that support came to an end. We extended it for about eight months, I believe. And so if you're running on these versions of Ruby, you should move off of it. Um, and if you did not know, earlier this year, uh, at the end of February, Ruby 1 at 3 support has also ended, which means that if you're doing any, uh, it's not getting any bug fix or security maintenance releases at all. Um, so if you're on this, you're kind of on your own for backporting and doing your own security. Uh, like, I remember I was talking to Graham from ThoughtBot and they had a client that was on Ruby 1.9.3 and he was asking me about like, how to backport uh, security stuff for the most recent security thing that came out. And you definitely don't want to be in this boat. Uh, especially if you're on Heroku, we do all the work for doing this. So uh, as an example, uh, like, on Christmas, um, on the day that Ruby 2.2.0 came out, we had Ruby up and running, I think, within a few hours of the release. So this is something that we take a lot of pride into. Uh, we basically on try our best on the same day. And I think we've only missed one MRI release uh, since we uh, actually had multi-Ruby support uh, for MRI. So um, to, uh, to give you a sense of like how many Rubies we built in the last year since last Wells off, uh, I have personally built 55 rubies across uh, both the CDRM C to 14 stacks, including MRI and JRuby. So this is work that you don't have to do to uh, deal with it all. You can just like get up and running on that day. So um, you should have to take advantage of this and not try to maintain your own Ruby at all. Um, uh, and the other probably big change that affects customers is that we now recommend Puma. Uh, this has been something that's been in the work for a while. We used to recommend Unicorn, and uh, I mean, if you're on Unicorn, it's not like super terrible. But one of the nice things about Puma is that it, if you don't know, it's a threaded web server, um, and if you don't, so if you have a thread-safe application, you can now use multiple threads. Um, 
but it also has a master worker model as well. So you can, if you have a non-thread safe app, you can, like you want to just have a single threaded worker, but have multiple worker processes uh, for the group map. So you can get that. And the other really nice benefit is Unicorn is built to sit behind like Nginx or Apache um, generally. Um, and so it does not have any logic for mitigating like um, slow connections, um, but Puma does. So um, we definitely recommend uh, migrating over Puma. And in our docs, we now are referencing Puma and have documentation for that. So it's something you should definitely look into. Um, in addition, uh, I, I don't know how many people know this, but we do also have JRuby support. Um, actually, we have we recently hired Joe Cutner to work on Java stuff. And if you don't know him, he's a uh, pretty uh, active contributor to JRuby itself. He also maintains Warbler uh, in the JRuby ecosystem. So uh, we have great JVM support. Uh, he works full time on that. So we have J. JDK 8 support now, as well as uh, when JRuby 9K came out, uh, by the next day we had um, support for that on the platform, so you can play around with that. And we also have really good relations with Charlie and Tom, so as part of the release, they notify us of it coming out and we test it. And I have filed uh, a handful of uh, bugs, like bug reports about the build system being broken, because I guess I'm one of the few people that actually test this. Um, so on to Ruby 4 updates by Luigi. Hello, my name is Koichi Sasada, a member of Heroku and a member of uh, Matschin. So Matschin uh, is uh, only for uh, hired by for the Ruby core. So the uh, mission is to uh, design new Ruby. So new Ruby means uh, Ruby 2.3 and Ruby 3. So, and also including quality of the MRI. Quality means several, quality has several meaning, but uh, for example, reducing the bugs, so no bug is nice, nice software, and also high speed, high performance, and low energy, uh, low resource consumption, so uh, low memory or something like that. We, uh, in Mastin, we have three members, uh, months. Maybe you know the uh, he he so he is a uh, little inventor of Ruby <coughs> and he designed everything <laughs> and also uh, no he, he we, we call him uh, Patch Monster because he fixed many bugs and include uh, so making many bugs and also fix the, these bugs so this is the common number of C Ruby and uh, you can see most of uh, patches. Uh, written by Nobu. So it means that the all your Ruby is based on Nobu. And also, uh, I, uh, it, it means, so I, I am a uh, design, designer, original designer of uh, Yao, Yao is uh, a yet another Ruby virtual machine. So it, it, it was introduced from Ruby by then. And also recently, and introduce generational incremental dishes. We released Ruby 2.2 uh, last year, and uh, we have several many many improvements. And I want to focus on uh, improvements, uh, keyword about keyword arguments. Keyword keyword argument keyword parameter is very slow from uh, as uh, Ruby 2.1, but just now Ruby 2.2 has improves the performance of keyword parameters, so please enjoy uh, using Ruby 2.2. And we are planning to uh, release Ruby 3.3 at the end of this year, so any suggestion, any idea are welcome, so uh, please catch me after later and discuss about this. Thank you. Uh, I don't really have one more slide for this. Um, so at, in the exhibition hall where you, the breaks and lunch are, um, so after this talk, so there's one more talk for this, but after that there'll be happy hour. Um, we're going to have an open source help desk. Um, uh, a bunch of folks in the open source community from both the Rails team, uh, Sam Pepin from RSpec, and Sam Saffron, who's done a bunch of performance work uh, on memory profiling and other tools, uh, works on the Discourse team. 
we'll be at uh, the Roku booth doing uh, basically ask us anything, uh, bring us your problems, or if you just have general questions or other things, um, Koichi would be there if you want to talk to him about Ruby 2.3 or if Rio if you want to complain about concurrency or something. Um, so we'll, we'll do that for, uh, during uh, the whole happy hour, and then uh, if we need to, we'll bleed into the light and talks there. Um, and then tomorrow in the afternoon break, uh, Richard Schneeman, um, one of our, our coworker, will, he wrote a Roku up and running book. He'll be doing a book signing thing. Uh, I think he only brought a limited number of books, so if you want to book, uh, show up, I guess, earlier. Um, and that's kind of all I had. So, I mean, that Roku, uh, RailsConf, and Rails and Ruby are still really important to us. If you can't tell, we're still heavily invested in it, uh, both with Max's team, uh, keeping up with Rails friends, um, and then obviously, like, all of our Postgres work as well. Like, I think Postgres has become, uh, I think at this point, the de facto, like, database for doing a lot of Rails applications. So, um, thank you. Come visit us at our booth, and um, looking forward to talking to all of you.